God was to appear immediately. So he's moving us from the kingdom to the kingdom. And in the middle of this, he gives six references to the kingdom of God. So all of this is about the kingdom of God. And when you read this and when I preach on this, I've got to keep that in the context of all that we're saying. This is about the kingdom of God. And if you think, well, that's a huge subject, you'd be absolutely right. But Luke narrows the themes that he wants to talk about. He introduces the king because if you remember what Jesus said when we started this section to the Pharisees, he says, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. In other words, here's the king, and I'll show you my, that I'm king by all that I'm doing. And so we see the kingdom of God on display as Jesus heals and does everything that's unbelievable, even raising the dead. But look at 1831. He's going to mention the sacrifice that the king will make for his people. Look at 1831. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, he will be shamefully treated, he will be spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise again. So there's one mention of the king There's one mention of the sacrifice that the king will make, but in the middle are so many references. Luke spills so much ink on the theme of salvation in regard to the kingdom of God, and rightly so, because I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, we're almost to Jerusalem, and so everything that he wants to talk about is to help us understand how to gain entry into the kingdom of heaven. Look at some of these passages, and I've got all these up here for you. 18.14, Jesus will say, I'll tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. Verse 17, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter. 18.24, Jesus saying that he had become sad said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. 18.42, Jesus says, You have recovered your sight. Your faith has made you well. And I'll talk about that. It's a unique phrase. Jesus just literally said, your faith has saved you. And then when you look at 19.9, this is what Jesus says. Today salvation has come to this house since he is the son of Abraham. And then in 19.10, for the son of man came to seek and to save that is lost. So everything that I'm going to talk about over the next several weeks is helping you either evaluate your salvation and making sure that you understand the commitment that you made to Christ, or if you're lost, it's going to be pressing you toward putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is an amazing set of passages. And I sat down and did all the connections from 17 to 19, and it looks something like that. And Paige is like, please don't do that to us. That's either a flight tracker chart of American Airlines or my notes, one of the two. But they look the same. So I whittled it down to two questions for you that you really need to ask yourself over the next two weeks, and and that is these questions. What do a tax collector, what does a tax collector, children, a blind beggar, and a rich man who is willing to climb a tree have in common? And you really need to know what these people have in common because it's these people who are welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, and that's a bizarre list, right? Right? But you also need to wrestle with the question, why is a man who attends worship regularly, ties faithfully, is morally exceptional, why is that man not welcomed, will not go into the kingdom of heaven? And that should strike you as bizarre as well. But we're going to find all of these in these passages as we look through these slides. But you have your Bibles open, so let me read 9 down through 17, and then we'll turn to the Lord in prayer. Luke 18, verse 9, Jesus says, or Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus or in this way, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, 
But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And in a very connected way, he continues on in verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our opportunity that we have as just a handful of believers gathered this morning to pray to sing glory to your name, and now to sit under your word. Father, you alone are God. You alone created the heavens and the earth. And you alone have spoken to your people so clearly that we have it written down for us. So we have absolutely no excuse. But you've gone even farther than that. You have given us your spirit who is our teacher and our guide, who opens up our minds and hearts to the scripture and explains it to our souls. So, Father, we pray that your spirit would be so active right now as I preach with my failing words. May the spirit of God take those and transform those into powerful words that will transform us into the image of the glory of your son. Help us, Father to hear and help us to believe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The parable is, again, spoken to a particular group of people, and it's not the disciples. If you'll look with me at verse 9, again, I have it up here for you. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Now, first of all, you have to pause before you even jump into it. And marvel at the grace of God. Because we're three years into this ministry that Jesus has been faithfully preaching the gospel to people who refuse to hear. And so here we are again. Jesus is explaining to them the error of their ways. And sadly enough, we know the end of the story, they will not hear this time either. But then you have to ask yourself the question, how many times did I hear? the gospel, before I repented and put my faith in Christ. And you appreciate the grace of God and the compassion of God to continue the preaching of the gospel. One missionary asked the question, I wouldn't agree with him theologically, but I appreciate the question, what right do you have to hear it twice when there's so many men who haven't heard it once? And you need to think about that. How compassionate it is for God to continue to preach the gospel to us so many times. But the reason that they will not trust him is because they've chosen to trust in themselves rather than God. Now trust is in a perfect tense. If you know what that means, you know what a terrible state or condition it is to be that way. In a perfect way, they remained in their trust. This is where their heart stands I will trust in myself, period. That's the tense of that verb. That's where they are. They trusted in themselves, right? So this man was convinced that he had done enough and that he continues to do enough in order to be saved. And the sad thing is, this man is desperately not alone. He is standing in the midst of masses of people in his time and in our time. And there's a really good reason for that because self-trust originated in the garden with our first representative, Adam. You think about that. It's exactly what Adam did. God gave him his word. All he had to do was trust in God and what God said. Adam rejected that. Adam rebelled against that. Adam turned away from that. And he said, no, I'll trust in myself and I'll do what I think is best. And you have to realize the moment Adam did that, he plunged all of humanity into sin, yes, into death, yes, but also into this terrible disease that's a product of those things. We trust in ourselves, period. It is difficult for us to turn away from our own thinking 
and trust in someone else. And so that's what we wrestle with until Christ comes. So this man in this parable is like so many in his day as well as so many in our day. He trusted in his own righteousness. He trusted in his own goodness, his own works, his own merit in order to justify himself before God. Let me tell you something. There's no greater lie that's going to lead to the condemnation of more men than this lie right here. The lie that you've been good enough or accomplished enough or avoided enough evil in some sort of cosmic balance in order to be accepted by God. So many men and women will spend eternity in hell because they have believed in themselves. And so, again, verse 9, he told this parable to some who. And that reminds us, again, he's not alone. So let's make sure the some who does not include you, because again, it includes everyone who has not trusted in Christ. So this man trusted so much, listen to his prayer in verse 11. Notice his words. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed in this way, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, we're taken aback by that, but you have to understand, he prayed in his context. He prayed in his culture, and it fit perfectly and would have made absolute sense. And this is not an exhaustive list. We can shift this list if we want. This is not a principle of Scripture. This is what goes on in the heart of every single man. And so if we want to contextualize this prayer into our own culture, it would sound something like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, homosexuals, liberals, Black Lives Matter supporters, or even this politician standing over here. And that begins to hit home a little bit. Because that's exactly how we think sometimes. If we're not careful And we have to understand something with that statement. Sin is what condemns us, and we're all sinners. And so this man stands up and gives the list of things that he's not like, just like so many do today, and stand up and give a list of people they're not like, right? And we need to be careful that we're not the ones doing that. So before we tear down this guy's way of thinking, I really want to start with the heart of the problem because he doesn't understand righteousness. If he truly understood biblical righteousness, he would understand that there's no way possible he could ever trust in himself, right? So let's talk about righteousness. And that's one of those unique words. It's like the kingdom of God. It's a broad term. It's really massive to even think about. But you'll also notice when you begin to set about the task of understanding the righteousness of God, it's when it's in a particular context, its meaning begins to shift somewhat. I mean, yeah, there's an overall umbrella definition. Righteousness is doing what's right. So if you wanted a simple way to describe righteousness to an unbeliever, you'd say doing what is right. It's the basic meaning. But there's so many nuances that shift it. Let me give you an example. If I was sitting in a basketball game with you and I watched a guy lob up a basketball and a kid grab a hold of it and dunked it and my response was sweet, you'd know exactly what I was talking about. But if I'm sitting at a table and there's a piece of chocolate pie in front of me and I go, sweet, that's a different context. Or if I, for some reason, gave my wife flowers like I never do and she responds, oh, how sweet. Well, you can under, you'd see that I, I need to be in the context to understand what you mean. I just can't write that word on a piece of paper, okay? Righteousness works in a similar way, if you will. You have to understand the context in which it's said to better understand the words. I want to give you just three, and they're probably the three most primary ones, and this is the first one. One of the ways the Old Testament uses righteousness is in the context of justice, This is easy. It'll make sense to you perfectly because our expectations of a judge is to always seek for righteousness and do what's right. That's why we go to a judge. What do we call him? Your honor. Why do we call him that? Because we expect him to behave honorably and do the right thing. That's why we're standing before you. Exercise justice on the basis of the law. The Bible refers to that as righteousness. God is certainly a righteous judge when you think about this. All of his judgments are just. All of his judgments are true. They are righteous. 
He is just on both sides of the scales of judgment without partiality. Meaning, God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, and at the same time, he will not forsake the innocent. God is perfectly just, and he does so because he is righteous. So we see God's righteousness even displayed in punishment. Notice Romans 2, 5, and I have it up here for you. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So when you think about God pouring out his wrath on sinners, that should not surprise you. That should be an obvious conclusion because God is righteous and he will punish the wicked by pouring out his wrath on them. But in a very similar way, or really, I guess, in the opposite way, we see God's righteousness displayed in protecting the innocent. And the innocent is often described in Scripture as the poor, the lame, the blind, the oppressed. And in God's righteousness, he delivers us from wicked oppressors. Notice Psalm 72. May he judge your people with righteousness... And you're afflicted with justice. Let the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. May he vindicate the afflicted of the people. May he save the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. It's on both sides of the balance. And why does God do that? Because he's absolutely impartial. His justice is perfect. And so he will pour out his wrath on the wicked And he will deliver the innocent, the poor, the oppressed. Everything that God does is like this, and it is considered righteousness. Now, you also have to realize, and here we begin to fall away from God's righteousness. God commands this sort of righteousness or justice for his people. God wants us to do what's right and judge impartially. And here's one of the passages that's been so misused this past year in in the subject of social justice but here it is in Amos 5 God tells us hate evil love good establish justice in the gate let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream so when we think about context here's our first context God is absolutely perfectly just and he judges without impartiality and he calls us to do what's right You do what's right in regard to people and do not display impartiality. And then you have to ask the question, how have we done? Man, we do so well in particular situations, but then we get in other situations and we begin to get partial. And we get away from justice and we fall from God's righteousness. The next context that you find it is righteousness looks exactly like faithfulness god is faithful to keep his promises or his covenants and in scripture that's called righteousness because god keeps his promise the bible says god is righteous now put up isaiah 46 for you and listen to what how the lord describes his righteousness he says remember the former things long past For I am God, there is no other. I am God and there's no one like me saying my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I've planned it. I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn minded who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It's not far off. My salvation will not delay and I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. God says, I don't care about your unfaithfulness. It does not change my faithfulness because I'm a righteous God. Listen, all of creation, heaven and hell, if it stood against the Lord Jesus Christ coming, it could not have hindered that event because that event was based on God's promise. God always fulfills his promise. Therefore, God is righteous. Of course, the son would come. Because the Son was the only one who could deliver us. And you got to remember, God made that promise to very unfaithful, unrighteous people, and he kept his promise anyway. So when we stand against this idea of righteousness or faithfulness, how have we been in keeping 
our promises and our covenants we've made with God? Not very well. In fact, I went back realizing that God demands that we be righteous in this respect and keep our promises. And I went back to Exodus 19, and this is a picture of Moses coming down the mountain with the law. And it says in verse 7, So Moses came and he called elders of the people. They set before him all the words that the Lord had commanded them. All the people answered together and said this, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And he had to hear that. So you're going to do everything that I said. Okay, we'll see how that goes. But you see, this is righteousness. And God commands us to be righteous in respect to keeping our promises, our covenants with him. You know, just as a side note, I surely don't need to do this very often because there's a lot to talk about this morning. But I remember promise keepers. Any of you people old enough to remember that? You go to these conventions and you read these books and then they bring all the men down front and you make all these promises of how you were going to treat your wife and how you were going to do for your kids and, and how you were going to study God's word. And you know, I never did that. I wasn't no fool. I know I'm not going to keep my promise. Why in the world would I stand up in front of a bunch of people and say I would? I'll just take the pen that I signed the paper with and stab you in the back with it. I, I know how men are. I know how I am. We're not righteous in regard to keeping covenants and promises, right? Now, that being said, what comes to mind is the promise that we make on our wedding day, and we keep that by the grace of God and the power of God alone, and I understand that and beg for the mercy of God in respect to that. But I also know how we treat promises and covenants. They're just like insignificant to us. We're very unfaithful. So, as if... We're not already so far behind in meeting God's righteous standard. We walk into the New Testament and we see a righteousness that becomes unrealistic for us to even obtain. And it's a righteousness that looks so much like holiness. It's a righteousness that not only involves justice. It's a righteousness that not only involves keeping our covenant or our promises to God and being faithful. It's not only a righteousness that has outward good deeds, but it's a righteousness that permeates the inner man completely and thoroughly affecting his thoughts and his motivations. It's righteousness in its fullest and grandest sense. That's the New Testament righteousness. It's a perfect righteousness. In fact, it's a righteousness that reminds me of those passages in Isaiah 6 where the angels cry out forevermore, holy, 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 describing the character of God. What they're in effect saying is righteous, righteous, righteous. He is perfect, perfect, perfect in every way. That's the kind of righteousness that we run into when we turn to the New Testament. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 5, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. It's a sense of righteousness, a perfect righteousness that you have to understand only comes to us by way of divine grace. It has to be a gift. There's no way possible for us to obtain it or to reach it. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Guys, if God doesn't declare righteousness over us, we will meet the wrath of God because we cannot achieve it. It's a declared righteousness. It's a gift of righteousness. How in the world could you ever trust in yourself for that kind of righteousness? That's foolish beyond measure. And yet so many people continue to trust in their own righteousness. Lord willing, we'll be in Romans next. And I put up a couple of passages just to begin to get you to think about this because this is Paul's thrust in the book of Romans. He says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God 
through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. This is the only way you'll ever be righteous. And here's why it's the only way, because Paul says before that, there is none righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's none who seek for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And until you believe that, until you understand that, you know nothing of the gospel nor of Christ, nor of righteousness. It's declared, it's given to us as a precious gift through faith in Christ. So let me get back to this guy. When it comes to the righteousness of justice, here you go. We fail. When it comes to the righteousness of faithfulness and keeping our promises, we fail. And when it comes to the righteousness of holiness, man, you're not even close. But in spite of all of this, there's still so many people. In fact, I've been to a funeral where he wrote a letter. And in the letter that he wrote, he said, I hope I've been good enough. That's just how people think. I really hope I've done enough. I really hope that I avoided enough. I really hope that I've been enough in order to be accepted by God. And the man who thinks this way is an utter fool he doesn't understand God's righteousness or his own sinfulness. And when I was thinking about this, I thought about Matthew 7 where Jesus says, Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are only a few who find it. Of course there are. Because there's only going to be a few who understands. I have to obtain righteousness. And the only place that I can get it is from God. And it will have to be a gift. I want you to notice the parable that we'll talk about next week. Look, if you're in Luke 18, look in verse 18. It's the exact same attitude that we find in the parable of the rich young ruler. Verse 18 says this, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked the question, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And the man says, all these I've kept from my youth. In other words, I'm good too. Jesus asked him, well, why are you calling me good? You know that only God is good. I know that God is good, but you need to understand I'm good too. I've done everything that God has required of me. And so we see this attitude throughout all these pages Men are absolutely convinced that they're good and righteous, but they're not. And so if we're not good and if we're not righteous in the eyes of God, what hope do we have? Well, we have to hope that God is merciful. Because that's the only way that He can respond to us in our condition. And we have to be filled with joy for the fact that God has said Himself... I am a merciful God. In fact, where is it here? In Titus 3, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. That is how He has saved us. So since we've come back around to mercy, let's meet this other man that we're going to find in this parable down in verse 13. Love Luke here. We've got to turn the corner. So verse 13, he says, But. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Finally, we meet a man who gets it. And it's a tax collector of all things. And I don't like the A. If you're using NASB, I think most translations has A center. It's not A center. It's the definite article, the. I am the sinner. Paul says the same thing to Timothy in 1 Timothy. This is how the man understands himself. I'm the sinner. That's who I am. God, be merciful to me. I'm the sinner here that's calling out to you in prayer. Now, there's so much to say about sin, and there's obviously so much to say about mercy. 
but I also know there's not that much time, so I will come back to mercy in the next week or so. But this man understood a few things very clearly. Number one, God is holy and I am not. And you have to get to that place. You have to stop comparing yourself to other people. You have to stop watching television and beating up all these people that you see on television doing so many foolish things. And you have to sit down and you have to realize God is so holy I cannot understand it or describe it. And I am likewise so sinful I don't have the vocabulary to carry my heart that down deep. This man did and that's why he understands his only hope is to cry out to God. But not only does he understand that God is holy and he is not, but he also understands that God is merciful and so he cries to this merciful God. And then the verse says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. In other words, one man trusted in his merits and another man trusted in God's mercy. And it made absolutely all the difference in the world. Now, I want to carry to verses 15 and 17 so we can move quickly because they're very well connected Now they were bringing even infants in verse 15 to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What is he talking about there? Well, these passages have been so misused in so many different ways. Some people love to use this as proof text that all children go to heaven. That is not what this is saying here. I could convince you of that in in other ways, primarily based on the character of God, but that's not what he's saying here. Others, oddly enough, like to use this as a proof text for infant baptism. The argument goes, Jesus was laying his hands on them and blessing them. And the new covenant way that we receive the blessings of God is through baptism. Therefore, baptize your babies. It's not doing that either. But I think the greatest mistake that we make is using this as the merits of children necessary for salvation. Their humility and their willingness In other words, we're still trying to find merit somewhere. And so we'll look at a child and try to gain their merit. One commentator put it this way, and this helped me understand this so much. He says, Jesus does not bless the children for their virtues, but for their deficits. They are important because of what they lack. They are small. They are powerless. They are needy. They are weak. They are insignificant. And so they are the sort of people who will be found in the kingdom of God. They are those who are absolutely without any merit. That's a child. Luke, even he'll, um, not Luke, but Matthew puts it this way. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he ends it, or Luke ends this in exactly the same way. For Luke quotes this parable in verse 14, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So how do the world do we not turn humility into a merit or a virtue? And this is how. Because if I held a child up here, and I made this statement, oh, this is such a humble child. You go, it's a bizarre statement. We don't know if that child's going to be humble or not. What would I be talking about? Well, I'd be talking about this. Here's someone who can't feed themselves. Here is someone who can't clothe themselves or bathe themselves. Here's a person who can't even walk, let alone talk. Here is a person that's absolutely and utterly helpless In every way, their circumstance in life is one of great humility. They're pitiful. They need for everything. Everything has to be provided for this child. And we would look at that and go, oh my, what a humble circumstance that person is in, right? We would say the same thing about someone that's absolutely, genuinely homeless. And I've seen some of those in other countries, laying on the street, almost naked, 
What a humble set of circumstances. Not that, oh, you're a humble person. No. Your circumstances are pitiful. They're so humble. You, you're famished. You're thin. You're, you're in the weather. It's raining on you. And I've seen that slumped over, without clothes, without a blanket. It's cold. What a pitiful set of circumstances you're in, brother. That's what he's talking about with a child. It's not a virtue. It's a state or a condition. And you arrive to that state or condition when you see the holiness of God and you understand your own sinfulness. And you understand the only hope that I have is for somebody to feed me, somebody to bathe me, somebody to clothe me, somebody to carry me because I can't walk, and somebody to communicate for me because I can't talk. And if you find yourself there, you've understood sin and you've understood God. And now if you'll just cry out to Him for mercy, you'll be fine. Because God is a merciful God that longs to save. These are beautiful verses, but don't just let them be beautiful verses. Let them change your life. We forever not only are saved by the mercy of God, but we walk by the mercy of God and we will be delivered into the presence of God by the mercy of God. Let's pray.